Welcome to episode 247 of the Skate Podcast. I'm Brian DeFelice, joined by Bridget Pru and Scott McLaughlin. Bridget and Scott, for the third straight game, the Bruins have given up at least five goals in the game. They look awful. They look like Swiss cheese. I know Scott prefers cheddar, but they look like Swiss, and it just hasn't been great for them. And it's one thing to lose. Losses are going to happen. It's another to just not look competitive at all. And for the last nine periods of hockey for this team, they haven't been very competitive at all. So let's start with our opening shifts and get right into what's ailing this team as of late. First off, I probably prefer Provolone above everything else anyways. Um, yeah, so my, my opening shift uh, is it's time to split up the top line. Jim Montgomery already got a head start on that because he did it late in the second period of Monday night's game. But we had talked in the last podcast about the Marsh and Zaka Pasternak trio being a little bit quiet the last few games and i think they really hit a low point monday night uh when they were on the ice before getting split up the bruins had been out attempted nine to three outshot four to one outscored two nothing just just awful and it was four straight games for them without a goal as a line so we can talk about, you know, what we think might work going forward or what they might do. They ended up on three different lines, um, which I think might be a good idea. Um, just because it seems like whatever momentum they had been building has been gone for, you know, basically for a week now. And they might have to all kind of refine their form away from each other. Yeah, my opening shift is that... They, I mean, for the first five minutes of the game, it looked like, okay, Bruins are back on track. And then from that point on, it looked, it it just was disastrous. Um, It was so bad that for the first time this season, uh, they had to pull a goalie mid-game. And we haven't seen that in a long time. So Swayman played the first period in like five minutes or so. Um, He got pulled in the second after it after letting up two goals and I, they were a little bit soft, but it, it felt like also was really just a message being sent from Montgomery. Uh, so Walmart comes in and it was, it just wasn't a great goaltending game either. I know uh, Allmark made some good saves once he got in, but it, we talked about how the goaltending was saving them and they've been giving up, you know, they've, they've given up five goals in the last three games, like we mentioned, and they gave up, um, more this over the stretch of the past four games than you than they had been as well. So it's it's been the goaltending hasn't been as solid either. <laughs> so you talk talk about switching up the first line. Um goaltending still not the issue, but it, it it just wasn't as sharp. And Bridget, uh before we started recording, you mentioned that it was the first time in 10 years that the Bruins had given up five plus goals in three straight games. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, that's yep. That was at the end of the broadcast. Uh, that's the first time, which it's been a long time, and you you kind of like it, kind of a jarring stat too, because it's like okay, well, I mean, we know that they've had some bad stretches, but at least in those bad stretches over the last ten years, I guess they weren't they still weren't giving up that many goals that close back to back. Yeah, and a big reason why that is so infrequent is because this team has an identity over the last call it 15 years really of getting back on track when you do have those those hiccups right not letting a loss turning into turn into a losing streak um they've always responded when they've had a couple of off games um they seldom lose back-to-back games especially in regulation or let alone three with the amount of goals given up and a big part of it is because of their identity and their identity has always been you know, the, the team's changed personnel wise and it's changed year to year. Um, but there's always been that some years they have more offense, some years they have a little more physicality, but there's always been goaltending and defense uh, as their identity. And, and that's just gone out the window the last week of hockey. Um, so I guess my opening shift is like, is this a bit of an identity crisis for them? Like they're supposed to, we all knew they were going to maybe struggle offensively outside of Pasternak this year and a couple of others, but defensive goaltending was going to be their, their bread and butter to keep them in these games. And that has been the entire team has been terrible offense, defense and goaltending. Um, so 
you know, I, I mentioned after the Rangers game, like adversity is good. We, the Bruins kind of, aside from McAvoy and Marshan starting the year on the shelf last year, last year's Bruins didn't really face a ton of adversity heading into the playoffs. The last couple of losses to Detroit and the Rangers was a good opportunity to, to learn from adversity and be better off for it. But if you allow it to compile too, too much, you don't want it to, you know, when it rains, it pours, you don't want it to pour. You want it to, you know, subside a little bit. So, um, is this an identity crisis for the Bruins? Do you see this potentially slipping? I mean, they get San Jose next. If they lose to San Jose, they could start, you know, panicking. The reason teams get into losing streaks is because you just you start to lose that swagger and that confidence. Yeah, and it would also be concerning if they lose to San Jose because they finally get to practice in between games. Uh, so they have Tuesday off as a travel day coming back. And then they get a full practice on Wednesday before they play again Thursday night. They have not practiced in a week and a half. Their last practice was a week ago Sunday. So it's it's not an excuse because the schedule has been kind of busy for everyone. And Columbus, by the way, just played a back-to-back. They played on Sunday as well. Um, but it, it is harder to correct mistakes, right? If you're starting to have breakdowns defensively in your coverage or your rush defense or – offensive zone sites or whatever it might be, wherever the breakdowns are happening, it's harder to fix that when you can't get on the ice and practice and actually go through those reps. Um, you know, you, you don't do so much in a morning skate. You're not really going through stuff over and over and over again. You're kind of hitting a couple basic things. You can look at video, but that's video. You're still not on the ice doing it. So yeah, I'm sure they're going to have a lot to work on Wednesday in practice. Um, but they should be able to get some stuff corrected. And you would think come out with a much better effort Thursday. You're right. If they don't, and if they keep playing like they have these last three games, then that is pretty concerning. Um, you know, it, as far as an identity crisis, I'm not quite there yet because, Again, I like I think they have a chance to work through this. I think the mistakes are correctable, but certainly, um, you know, certainly a low point. Like it, th- losing the, those games to Detroit and New York, that's one thing. Those are two playoff teams. The Rangers right now are the best team in the conference, you know, a couple percentage points ahead of you. Um, Columbus is just not they're not a good team. They have the worst record in the Eastern conference. So that really, you probably shouldn't have needed practice to be able to bounce back against Columbus. And yet here we are, they played awful against Columbus. Yeah. And think about how many breakaways they went on and didn't score on. Like they could have, they they could have had more, you know, they, they could have tacked on more goals. Johnny Gaudreau had like two breakaways, um that got stopped I mean they did score on one of their breakaways but um you can't just let that happen and and that's a defensive breakdown I know you know Gaudreau was kind of cheating and whatnot but um those are just things that we haven't really seen happening uh with the Bruins earlier in the season and yeah definitely practice is much needed I wonder what that's going to look like because last time Montgomery thought people were sluggish he ran them so I I just wonder what kind like what is the approach in this practice we're kind of starting to learn a little bit more about what Montgomery's coaching style is like when the team is struggling whereas last year we didn't see it all that much Um, I have a question to go back to let's go back to Scott's opening take for a second split up the top line is uh was yours and i want to get everybody's like idea of what the line combinations like what in your mind would work to get to kickstart something for some of these players like i understand moving Pasternak next to some of the players who might be slumping a little bit could maybe help them but we're dealing with some snake bitten people potentially um, all getting put onto the same line. So uh, just everybody's thoughts on what do you want as your top six? And I guess really top nine, because it affects the third line as well. Scott, do you want to go first? Yeah. I I mean, so I guess it's probably worth starting with um, where Montgomery eventually ended up for the third period, which was 
he had Heinen Patra Pasternak as a line, Marshan Coyle DeBrusque, Van Reems like Zaka Geeky, and then Lauko Beecher Frederick. I guess I'd be okay sticking with that, but I'd probably make just a couple tweaks. I'd put DeBrusque with Patra and Pasternak. And then a couple things there. Like you're you're keeping Potter and DeBrusque together, who again, I think for the most part have played pretty well, just haven't scored a ton. Well, give them Pasternak and see if they start scoring a ton. Uh then I'd put Frederick back with Coyle. So I'd go Marshan and Coyle Frederick. Um, you know, keep Coyle with one of his usual uh wingers. Marshand has probably been at his best this season when he was with Coyle earlier in the year. And it, it sounds kind of crazy to think like, oh, put Marshan with Coyle to get Marshan going, right? Like usually that would be like a thing you do to get Coyle going. Um, but that's sort of what it feels right, like right now. I mean, no one's playing better than Coyle, so maybe that does help Marshan out. And then with Zaka, I, you know, JVR is probably on his wing because uh, they're kind of just – what's left and then you put either geeky or Heinen on their right. And I guess I'd go Heinen. Cause I think he's, I think he's been playing pretty well for the most part. So, um, you know, you could call that the third line if you want, and then leaves you with kind of the same fourth line of Lago beach or geeky, or if you want to get steam back in there, I'm fine with that too. Yeah. I, I, I really don't have any arguments there, Scott. I think you try to, you try to get everybody to, be in a situation where they can either break out of a slump or get somebody else going. Um, I mean, as it pertains to DeBrusque, it's like, and I think there's a question on him, so maybe we'll get into it a little bit more later, but you don't, it's almost like you don't really want to reward him because he hasn't been producing, but he hasn't been producing, right? So something's got to give and, and maybe it's because he needs to put him with somebody, um, you know, that can, that can be more of a, an elite playmaker. And while he's had opportunities to play with those people in the past, that's the past, like what can help this Bruins team tomorrow. And I think, yeah, I think the lines you said, I, I, I co-sign on, it's just kind of a matter of like spreading things out a little bit and seeing, seeing what's, what sticks. Obviously um, JVR coil and Frederick has been, has been good. Um, don't love the idea of breaking them up, but, like, you know, they're not Gretzky and Curry out there and, and, and it's, it's about the team, not one line. So um, I, I, I would echo what you said. Yeah. And, and they did have pasta Patra to brusque together at different points in the game. I do not like the idea of a Marshawn coil to brusque line only because I feel like Marshawn and DeBrusque are the two most like snake bait guys on the team right now. Coyle is doing well, but like I don't want that. I don't want it compounding and maybe taking away from Coyle, especially since we know his success has come with Frederick and, and uh, Van Riemsdyk. I do like Pasta Patra De, DeBrusque, and the whole point of that line would be to get everybody more involved in the offense. And when you have a guy like Pasternak on the ice, a lot of the defense has to end like he's drawing defenders. Like he's the guy on the ice that is getting the most attention. Maybe that opens up room for DeBrusque. Maybe that opens up room for Potter to be a little bit of a better playmaker. He maybe has a little bit more room to stick handle. Um, maybe it turns out that, you know, that that ends up solving a little bit of that problem. Pa Potter did score in the last game. Him and Beecher had the only two goals. Um and it was kind of accidental. Uh, it, was, it was a good finish. Um, it was like an accidental pass for McAvoy. But um, either way, I like th that's the line I, I really like. Marshawn Coyle Frederick, I'm okay with. I just don't know if if that's gonna help. And then like if you if you kept the Coyle Frederick JVR line together. Would a Marshawn Zaka Heinen line work? Like, do, do you guys think that that would be fine? I kind of, I want to do what Montgomery did on Monday, and that is split up that entire top line, like everyone away from each other, because you could do that, but like, I don't think Marshawn Zaka has been working as 
part of a, as part of a line. So I would get them all away from each other and like just give them all different looks. Um, I guess it could be interesting to see jo- Zaka and JVR because they work together on the power play and like they a lot of times are like switching net front and bumper like they'll be moving up and down the slot like it could it could work with JVR and Zaka they haven't really played together five on five but they play together on the power play I guess that could get something going I mean real quick I just kind of want to mention maybe the elephant in the room that none of us have really said out loud including myself and just kind of like coming to mind and, and you guys bringing up these talking points makes it come to my mind a little bit more obviously but um, I haven't seen like Martian and, and Pasternak have not, I mean, they're far from the chemistry that they created a couple of years back. I mean, they didn't play together at all last year outside of the power play really. Right. I mean, it was, it was Pasternak, Krejci and Zaka. So my point is like, they've been away from each other as line mates for so long without Bergeron in the middle. They, they just, they don't really seem like they have much chemistry. I don't know if I'm off saying that, um, it seems like two guys who want the puck and it seems like Bergeron was just the perfect compliment for those two players. And without him in the middle, and it's no disrespect to Zaka, I, I have not seen Marshan and Pasternak look dynamic together for quite some time, even before this year. Cause last year they, they, they really, really played together. So I, I don't think that this team, like we mentioned earlier on, uh, previous episodes like maybe the Bruins load up that top line with with Marshan, Pasternak, and Zaka. I don't even think that's loading up your top line anymore because they haven't shown that they can really produce five on five together in a couple of years, mainly because they weren't together to do so. But when you're apart for so long, it takes a while to re- re- rekindle that chemistry, especially with a different centerman. So I don't even know if the Bruins are better off as we're discussing, even having them on a line together, tr- honestly. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought they had like started to show something and you're like, it wasn't perfection line type dynamite, but before this most recent tough stretch, they like that line did score in four straight games. They had five goals in in a four game stretch Um, chances, shots on goal. All that was like in the Bruins favor. And it was like, okay, that's starting to look like, like a top line, like this is, this looks pretty good. And then these last four games, it's really just falling apart. And it's, it's not like they're the only ones on the team that that's the case for, but I do think like part of a big part of the Bruins struggles is that their best players have, have not been anything close to their best players. Um, You know, if you look at like, who's in the, like I took these last five games, uh, so lumping in like the Tampa loss and the Florida win. And if you look at like, who's been on the ice for the most goals against Charlie five on five, most goals against these last five games, Charlie McAvoy, seven, David Postenark, five, Forbert, four, Marshan, four, Zaka, four, Lorai, four. It's like that, that's your top line. And the guys who were playing on your top pairing like that, that can't happen. And I think, I, I would say like McAvoy's probably been the, the least at fault out of all those names I, ju- I just read off, but that top line has clearly been at fault for quite a bit of the Bruins' recent struggles. Uh, without a doubt, honestly, and and I guess you're right, Scott. They did they did produce um, a little bit before this last tough stretch, but I mean. Martian and Pasternak, they were like the watching the Globetrotters back in the day when they were together, and they're far from that. And not having Bergeron, along with you know Martian's getting a little bit older and longer in the tooth, and he has he's had hip surgery. Maybe he's not the same player he was, obviously back in 2017, 18, 19. That's possible too, um, 2020. But another thing that I'm looking at, and um, you know, I can't help but think that this is problematic for this team right now is they're not getting any production from their back end. Now, they're not getting production from up front very in many places either. Um, but if you look at if you look at their defense core, I mean McAvoy has 14 points which is like in 17 games which is, you know, obviously respectable. Oddly enough, McAvoy's a minus 2 on the season. Hmm. Um, but then you go down and you have Lindholm 
with five points, Carla with five points, Lorai four, Shattenkirk four, Forbert three, Mitchell two, Grizzlick one, one point in 11 games. Like they're getting no production from their back end either. Um, and, you know, scoring, make no mistake about it. Offense is a team game. Yes, you have forwards that score, but it, it starts from the back end, starts in your own zone. It's a complete team effort. And um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of things. Now, <laughs> at the same time, they're what, 14, like four and one or two, like this, whatever the record is, like they still have a great record. So, but if we're talking about recent struggles and even struggles that they were having while they were winning, um, yeah, you can't help but look at the back end too and see that no one's really producing much of anything. I mean, for Lindholm to have five points, um, you know, that's not good enough. Like you need him to, you need to be a little bit closer to McAvoy. If McAvoy has 14 points, Lindholm needs eight, you know, not being tied with Carlo. Yeah, I mean, it's been it's just been noticeable offensively for the last few games. And we mentioned on the last podcast, it was like, I think we asked, like, oh, are you worried? Um, like, is it is it a trend that's going to continue? And we're all kind of like, oh, it's probably an anomaly. It's against good teams. It's a weird matinee weekend. And then you get this this game in Columbus where you should be the like pretty hev- heavy favorite um, in most positions on the ice and uh we saw what happened uh so my question was uh my well my going back to my opening shift what is the like if you were to maybe dole out blame a little bit what is the or who's most to blame or what's the main reason for so many goals against this season? Like not this season, this, this stretch of three losses. I mean, so, so I mentioned like the, the top players, I'd say, you know, especially in the tough stretch of the season, like your best players have to be your best players. And they have not been for the Bruins in at least the last three games. But even beyond that, it like, it's, I would blame overall puck management and decision making. Um, you know, like like Grizzly cough, coughs up the puck at the offensive blue line, leads to a breakaway goal, and it's like on the one hand, okay, that's clearly just a hiccup where like he went to make a pass and totally whiffed, and that's not something you see often, but it's sort of emblematic of just this larger issue that I think the the Bruins had started to make some progress on and has now clearly backslid uh, over the last week, which is just like not making plays, not being like hard enough with the puck kind of whiffing on, on passes or dump ins or like whatever it is that lead to quick turns up ice for the opponent and on men rushes, which has been a problem for them all year, giving up on men rushes and breakaways. And it's really reared its ugly head again recently. And, um, you know, we've talked just, I guess, to kind of like round out some of the top players, like Zaka, I thought was really bad Monday night, um, and has had a couple of rough games now recently, but him going for, on um, whatever goal, was it Columbus's first goal, second goal? I don't even remember, but where he breaks a stick and goes off for a change during, during the second period with the long change. And it's like, what are you doing? Like you, you're just giving Columbus a power play. It, it just turned into a five on four in zone. Columbus had possession the whole time and ends up with the goal with Provorov, you know, walking in and shooting through a screen. And it's like, again, just bad decision-making, just like not being aware of what's going on around you. Um, and when it's your your top players doing that, it's like, you know, bizarrely, like, I've, I don't know about you guys, but, like, I've mostly been okay with the play of some of the guys lower in the lineup. Like, sure, we can say, you know, like, Patras scores Monday night, first goal in 10 games. Yeah, you'd like to see him producing a little more. But I've been fine with his play. I've been fine with the the, the fourth line. Um the forward Chad and Kirk pairing had a tough night Monday for sure. And another one, like they were out on the ice and sort of highlights another problem, which has been, you know, Brian brought up last episode, but like not just, just not being strong enough physically. Like 
Shattenkirk and Forbert both lose battles down low. And then um, I think it was Voronkov just like takes it to the net between Forbert and Geeky and scores. And that, that was the once in my mind, soft one on Swayman where yeah, there are breakdowns around him, but he still should have made the save. Like it gets between him and the post and that's, you know, that's just not a goal you should be giving up. Yeah. It's, it's been ugly uh, all the way around and, you know, not for nothing. And for what it's worth, I do co-sign on, on Lorai being down in Providence, no big deal. But I will say if that was Lorai that the puck jumped over his stick, I feel like you'd have a bunch of people being like, Oh, he's not ready. He's not ready. Um, that see, he got to send down to Providence, but it happens to Grizzly and it's just a mistake. It's just a puck bounce. So that's interesting. Um, but anyway, not that you're saying that Scott, but, um, by it's any not means, like a passive aggressive shot at Scott. There. Has, I know see, it's not, it's not, it's not Scott. It's, it's, there's the, but I, I do have to, but you're right though, that like those of us who are like, you know, yeah, it's fine to send Lori down. It's not a great look that like Grizzly does this and. Yeah, and, and you know, because like it's like I can just imagine people being like, "You have to send Laura down to get this back in the lineup." And again, like overall, I think Grizz looks fine, and you know, he doesn't make mistakes like this often. But uh, not not great timing for that one. No, and I'm I'm just I'm more or less being yeah. funny. It is it is just a funny circumstance. But I I do think that a lot of people just kind of when it's convenient for their narrative, they'll point something out um, against somebody that they might not be in favor of, and what happens to somebody that they like, they'll just kind of you know poo poo it. Um, but that la- last night's loss is not on Matt Grizzly at all, or that puck, that puck bounce. Um, you know, one thing that bothered me last night too, in addition to everything that you guys are talking about is you lose, you lose to Detroit five, two, you lose to the Rangers seven, four, clearly like you aren't playing very well. You go and you play one of the worst teams in the league record wise in Columbus. And when the game's two, nothing. So before the game even gets away from them, like Pasternak, your top player, one of the best players in the world, gets a, you know, I'm not going to say a vicious, but it gets a you know decent decent hack to the ribs with a goalie paddle. Um, no one really does much of anything. And then McAvoy gets hit in the corner, um, you know, a little bit of an interference, not the craziest play in the world, but goes into the boards awkwardly. He's down. And the only guy who's, like, really showing any sort of emotion is a guy who has played with McAvoy for – all of like 15 games probably, and that's Morgan Geeky. Um, and I'm not saying that like Pasternak needs to drop the gloves in that situation or Lindholm. Um, but when you're when you're in a little bit of a slump and you're playing a team that is very beatable, you if you can't like get up after Pasternak gets hacked in the ribs and McAvoy goes down and 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 go back and try to win that game, instead they, nothing happens. The, and the only thing that they do is they go down another couple of goals and they go down four nothing. So there's a lack of there's a lack of um, pushback, I think, when things go uh, go against them. And and people might think I'm being harsh, but the reality of the situation is there haven't been many sample sizes for us the last couple of years to see them go through these stretches to see how they respond. This is one of a few circumstances where we're trying to see how they respond in adversity. And so far, because they've been playing so well record wise, and so. I guess it's kind of unfair, but at the same time, I don't have much track record to go off of the last couple of years where they have struggled and have had a chance to fight back. And so, so far, not great. Yeah. And when you brought up your question, Brian, are they having an identity crisis? This kind of was part of what I thought you were talking about. Like, isn't part of the Bruins identity to stick up for teammates, be physical, have that more like gritty, tough style of play. Uh, we, we mentioned that their identity comes from, like how sound and they are defensively and in net, but it also is supposed to be, especially what, from what we heard in the off season, what they were trying to build was a tougher team than they had last year. And it just doesn't seem like they have that right now. Yeah. It, like you're waiting for, especially as you know, Bridge, I think you said earlier, like they did actually start this game pretty well. And then they sort of hit the snooze button, like the second half of the first period. And, as that period's winding down or at some point in the second, you're, and especially around those two incidents you just mentioned, Brian, with Basnack and McAvoy, it's like you're waiting for someone to, yeah, it'd be great if someone changed momentum with a goal, but, you know, f- throw a big hit somewhere. Like, like do something physically to try to change momentum. And, like, we've seen 
McAvoy do that before, but it can't always be him. Like someone else has to be able to do that. And it just really never came last night. Like no one, no one stepped up and, and to the table and like took that task on. Um, you know, I'm not saying like they have to be running around like chickens with their heads cut off or anything, but a good well-timed hit somewhere, you know, finish, finish a play like could, could have helped. Um, so yeah, you know, some, someone's got to be willing to do that. And it's like, I know it's easy to look at Trent Frederick and like, that's an obvious name um, you can pick, but like, you know, Johnny Beecher has some physicality in his name, in his game, Jacob Lauko, uh, James Van Reems like, is a bigger guy. I know he's not overly physical. Shattenkirk can throw a hit. Forbert should be able to. Um, Carlo can use his, can use his size and weight. Like some, someone else has got to step up. It can't always be Charlie McAvoy. And I know, you know, Milan Lucic was going to be part of this. Like that was part of the idea of bringing him in, but he's, he's gone right now and he might not ever be coming back. So like you got to deal with it. You know, you can't, can't wait for someone else to do it. And you don't, and you don't always want to rely on bringing in a free agent to provide that. Like you want that to come from your DNA from within, right? Like it's easy to look at the Bruins. I mean, it's their hundredth season, right? So it's an appropriate time to discuss this. They've always been the big, bad Bruins. Right. And up until, you know, even it was always their identity always. And you look at the team in 2011 and 2013, a lot of those guys in that cup winning team, and it's easy to point out the toughness on those teams. You know, wh- where does the t- toughness end, right? I mean, Chara, uh, Lucic 1.0, uh, Nathan Horton was a tough guy. Their scores were tough. Greg Campbell, McQuaid, Boychuk, Ference. Um, I mean, just go down the list. Everybody was tough and, and stood up for each other. Not yeah, every not team. <laughs> did, I, I thought I mentioned him. I, so that's why. But yeah, Sugar Sean as well. Um, I mean, the list goes on, right? And not every team is going to have that type of toughness. I understand that. But as the years progressed, they still they still found ways to to be tough, right? Uh, Kevin Miller becomes a staple on the back end while Char is still there and McQuaid's still there. And then you go out and you bring in a guy like David Backus. Um, you know, Sean Corrali played tough. Noel Achari played tough. You had guys that played tough. Um, and then you go out and you get Nick Foligno and Trent. Like, you've always had toughness that I feel like with Lucic out of the lineup, Aside from Frederick, you don't you don't really have much toughness. I don't I don't want to be disrespectful and call this team that's won you know seventy nine percent of their last hundred plus games in the, in the in the league soft. They're definitely not a soft team, so don't mistake what I'm saying. But they're not overly tough at all. They're they're somewhere in the middle, and somewhere in the middle doesn't really get you very far in the springtime, in my opinion. So. You know, you can't go out there and bring in a bunch of new guys. This is their team. So they need to look across, you know, the room at, the, at each other and say, look, if someone's getting taken advantage of, in particular, one of our best players, one of the best players in the world, like it's great to be friends on off days and go out in the seaport or go out in the North End and, and have a couple of glasses of wine with each other and call yourself good friends and go to each other's weddings. But when you're on the ice, you have, that friendship has to carry over too and like stick up for each other. And it's just like, I just don't see a team that's very, formidable to play against physically and i know times are changing but if this team wants to be um, as good as they hope they can be they need to adopt more more edge simply put and and when when it comes to like the identity when you think about the identity of last year's team and you think about like who is at the center of it we talked about like a captain of the top six and a captain of the bottom six and they're both gone so like we called like Bergeron, the captain of, of, you know, and and the leader of those higher end top six players. And Felino was kind of a similar voice in the locker room and was a guy that would have stepped up and hit someone or dropped the gloves in a a moment like against Columbus. Um, So and so we did have a question about what the identity would be coming into the season. It seemed like everything settled in fine over the course of the first, uh, I don't know, like, 12, 15 games. Um, and then we we bring this question up again just because uh, sometimes you notice just a little bit of it lacking, a little bit of what they had last year lacking because they're missing these guys that were pretty much part of the person, like controlling the personality, the identity of the team. 
are gone. And we knew it was going to impact them at some point. And you're kind of seeing it now where sometimes you need someone to like either settle the team down, be the voice on the bench or step up, be the person to make a big hit, be the person to create the, the energy that your team needs to get them out of this hole that they were in, in Columbus. So, you know, it, it just, it's important to bring up just because we wondered if it would be a problem. Uh, and, you know, it, it hasn't really, been a huge issue through most of the season but occasionally on a game like against Columbus you notice it yeah one other point I would make here is who did Bruce Cassidy always highlight as a player who drags guys into the fight Brad Marchand right and I do think I think sometimes when Brad Marchand is in an individual slump sometimes that other like the the fire and the emotion sometimes that goes quiet too and I kind of feel like that's happening right now because you didn't really notice him doing much to try to spark his team last night either. And again, like he is usually one of the guys who will do it. So I still think the point remains like you need some other guys to step up and do it when it's not going to be Marsh and or McAvoy. Um, but it does kind of feel like sometimes it goes hand in hand with Marsh and where it's like, he's his most fiery when he's also playing some of his best hockey and it like all kind of feeds each other. And maybe he needs like, like whichever one has to come first, whether it's the scoring or, or maybe, you know, the, the emotion and fire with, without crossing the line too much, like at least one of those has to return and maybe the other will, will come with it. Yeah. I don't, it's a good point, Scott. I don't, I feel like he's, Got a, he has a very difficult time towing that line. I think for him, it's one or the other. He 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 either is on his best behavior because he knows if he shows his true colors, he's gonna get he's gonna be vulnerable to you know discipline, supplemental discipline, or a penalty in game. I don't think he's capable of of being um, a perfect agitator. It's kind of like he either goes all in or he doesn't, and that's kind of a problem because obviously like, you know, we've, we've seen for 15 years how effective he is when he's, when he's playing at his at the top of his game and emotionally engaged. My fear is that in addition to what you're saying, when you're slumping, you're kind of not feeling it. I also think Martian's one of those guys who like, if you give him truth serum or, or not, maybe he'll say it in the media, but like he, he just knows like it's a long season. Like you, you got to temper expectations. Um, and like you can't you can't be full gear every game. And he he's one of those guys who's like, relax, slow and steady wins the race. Everybody calm down. But at the same time, like you still have to play the game in front of you. And I and I don't really love that mentality. Um, so there's probably a little bit of that going on too. But just in general, like I understand it's 2023. Um, and like I said, the league's different, it's different players. And I'm not sitting here saying that like, you know, Jake DeBrusque or David Pashnak or it's Pavel Zaka needs to go out there and, and, and fight because it's not, it's not, it's not realistic. What I'm saying though, is like play with a little bit of like, like the Florida Panthers last year, when the Bruins played them, there weren't a lot of fisticuffs at all, but at all, if any, but they were clearly tougher because they four checked harder. They were annoying. Like you would just like, like Swayman or all Mark would cover the puck and maybe you'd see like Kachuk, you know, give like a little soft like shoulder to the defenseman stop in front of the goalie or maybe like they'll just hover over the goalie or snow the goalie. Like little, just little things like that to say that I'm engaged in this game. It can – little things like that can add up and make you annoying to play against as a team. Well, and to even use the example of the game against the Panthers from last week, last Wednesday, the Panthers were clearly the more physical team early on and they're taking – runs at McAvoy because they wanted, you know, some revenge for his hit to Oliver Eggman Larson that got McAvoy suspended. And I thought a couple things sort of settled that game down and kind of tamed the Panthers a little bit. One, you know, the, the Bruins scored like the Panthers for as much as they were dominating early, didn't score. And then the Bruins took the lead, but two Derek Forbert dropped the gloves early in the second period. And I thought that, like, it sort of sent the message that, like, okay, the Bruins were pushing back on the scoreboard and in terms of physicality. Like, they weren't going to 
be pushed around. Forbert's dropping the gloves. Like, here's the pushback. And the Panthers weren't running around the same way the rest of the game after that. And it's like, it, you're right. Like, it doesn't always have to be dropping the gloves, but just because you mentioned the Panthers, like, that came to mind as as an example of the Bruins doing what, you know, we feel like they didn't do in, in Columbus. I have one thing to say about Marshawn that I want to get to our email that you got, Scott. Um, so about Marshawn being the guy that can drag people into the fight, but him kind of towing the line. I mean, you kind of have to think about the weight of the captaincy, right? He can't be he you know like he can't go full Brad Marchand and also be like a responsible leader of the team and you he very much uh takes that into consideration trying to be more level-headed as now now that he's taken over the captaincy so you like you see him kind of fighting with his own, you know, tendencies to be kind of a pest, but also trying to be a good role model and also trying to not hurt his team and get suspended or get himself in the box. So it's such a fine line for him. And I feel like he takes it like it, it's even more difficult now with a C on his jersey to just go off one game and, and you know, do something stupid or, you know, cross the line on accident when you're just when you're trying to bring the energy, but you just don't do it in the right way because we know sometimes he doesn't. Um, so yeah, uh, that's my thought on Marshawn. Uh, and Scott, if you want to read, we got a question about Jake DeBrusque. Um, so from uh, Scott claims he didn't email this to himself, but it is from S Scott. <laughs> you want to, you want to read that? Great name. But before I do just one, one last thought that it just came, came to mind when you're talking about like taking penalties. I also wonder if maybe part of this is like the Bruins might feel like they can't sort of walk up to the line or take like an extra shot because they're taking so many other penalties already, like specifically stick fouls where it's like, you know, that, I mean, they gave Columbus five power plays on Monday. They gave Detroit six on Friday. Like this has been an ongoing issue too. They're one of the top teams in the league and, in minor penalties. And so, you know, if you feel like we're taking way too many penalties and we have to try to stay out of the box, then you're less, you know, maybe if you're only taking one or two penalties a game, you say, no, nah, you know what? I'm, I am going to like finish with this check, even if it's a little late, or I'm going to give this guy a little extra shot after the whistle. And I don't know, just, just crossed my mind, but um, yeah. So email from Scott uh, says, at what time do you think the Bruins stop making excuses for Jake, meaning DeBrusque, and move on from him? He wanted out, had something to do with getting the coach fired, has been given ample opportunities on different lines and with top players, still is not producing. He's in a contract year and will want to get paid like a top six forward. I don't think he deserves this. Um, Scott goes on to write, like, you know, when you ask for a trade, basically, like, usually that means you already have a foot out the door. Um, so, and he also adds that not sure he's good with Potra to, to round it out. But, yeah, what do you guys think? Because we haven't – so we, we've talked about DeBrusque and his contract situation a couple times, but we haven't really circled back on that in a little while. So I guess just your response to Scott's email and kind of maybe bigger picture feelings on where things are at with Jake DeBrusque right now. Well, first – Thank you for clarifying that it was Jake DeBrusque and not Jake from State Farm um, that you were referring to. And secondly, I think that objectively, if you're looking at his stats, which is what a top six forward is paid to produce, um, they're not good enough. And if, if your production is not going to be good enough, then you better be doing all the little things right. And a lot of people out there will tell me to their blue in the face, Look at the advanced stats. He is doing everything right. Okay. Well, how much is he affecting the game? Not a ton, um, really. So he's doing a yeah. He he's doing he's 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 doing fine defensively. He's not hurting his team outside of the lack of production. Doesn't play with a ton of emotion. Wouldn't call him a leader out there. Wouldn't say he sticks up for people. 
wouldn't say he sticks up for himself. And off the ice, I think he's really well liked. I think he's a funny personality, and I don't think he's a bad, bad person or a bad player. I think he's a good player that's going through a, a tough stretch offensively. But when you bet on yourself, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta come through. And um, a couple of months from now, maybe we're singing, maybe I'm singing a much different tune because he's turned things around and you know has like whatever twenty five points and you know thirty five games, whatever. But right now, eight points in 20 games, not good enough. And uh, you can sit there and tell me all you want that he's doing the little things right. But I personally don't think he's doing all the little things right. I think he's doing some of the little things right. Um, and he's not producing at the level that you need him to. So if you're asking me if they need to, if they should resign him next year, I don't know. I mean, has he, it depends what he's asking for, right? If he's asking for, two, for, for X amount of dollars, uh, no, it, it like it, he he's a top six talent, but he's not producing like a top six talent. So it's kind of a it's kind of a tough. But you, the one thing too for Boston is the Bruins aren't in a situation where they they can afford to rid of top six talent. He's just not producing, so it's it's tough. You don't want to get rid of the talent because when he does produce, he's a difference maker. But with him, it's the same old story. It's just too Jekyll and Hyde, and. I don't know. I guess if you're asking me if I were to re-sign him, I'd probably say I'd probably say yes because I feel like he's going to produce obviously more this year than he has been. And it's just like if you get rid of him, how how are you replacing him? Maybe it's through free agency. I don't know. It's a, it's it's a good question. I don't know if you guys have a a decisive opinion on him one way or the other. It's kind of too early to tell this year. But if you're talking about his track record since he's been here, man, the ceiling is there when he's on his game. It's just too far, uh, too far between. I have so I have kind of like I guess a nuanced opinion on this. I think that there's obviously a price that's too high for anyone, and Don Sweeney is not going to overpay. So everybody like there's a number in Don Sweeney's mind that he's not gonna he's not gonna pay him. A, you know, a certain amount. And I think Don Sweeney might have gotten a little bit more leverage. The fact that DeBrusque isn't having as good a season this year as he did last year. I think to the point of him already having a foot out the door and he showed that when he want, he asked to get out I and mean, he stepped right back in the door that season, signing a contract extension at the trade deadline instead of getting actually traded. So um, he stepped back in. Cassidy got fired. I feel like he's all the way back in. Honestly, in my opinion, he seems like he wants to be here. So I don't think he's trying to look elsewhere. I think he wants to get a contract extension done before free agency. I don't think he wants to go to free agency. So in terms of like, does he want to be here? I think the answer is yes. Um, I also think that well, we're 21 games into the season, right? Um, over the next 21 games, which would bring, or just say 20 games, uh, which would bring us to pretty much the halfway point of the season. He's going to have, this is just a prediction. He's going to have better numbers than he had in the first 20 games in the second 20 games of the season. I, I don't see it happening that he's like this the whole year. You call him Jekyll and Hyde. Well, he's been Hyde. I mean, wait, which one's the good one? Which one's the good one? Jekyll I, and Hyde. I actually don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. He's, he's been the bad one. He's going to come around to the good one at some point. Like it's, it's going to happen. I don't see him. And, and, you know, Brian, you mentioned it. He hasn't shown that he has been able to put the numbers up, but he also has brought the effort that we've seen lead to good things for him. So my prediction is that he that they do come to an agreement with him before the season is over and that his numbers in the next 20 games compared to the first 20 games are much more in line with something you'd see from a top six forward. I mean, Scott, I, I know you probably have a lot of thoughts on this, but just to kind of wrap up mine, like I he's shown he can produce at a high level, but he hasn't shown it consistently, right? And and if you look at if you just look at him. Um, over the course of his career, 405 games played, 234 points. If that doesn't tell you, like, he's kind of, like, up and down, I don't know what does. That's a big sample size, you know, over 400 games, and he's just over a half, half a point per game guy. So, you know, people can sit there and say, well, look at last year when he played between uh, Bergeron and um, Marshan, 
and then he got hurt, but he was on pace to, to shatter his career high. That's great. That's great. He was great last year. Um, but a 400-plus game sample size kind of speaks for itself. Yeah, so a couple of things here. So first to Scott's email, like I, I think that reconciliation and that recommitment to the Bruins, like that did happen in, in my opinion. Like I, I don't – yeah, clearly when you request a trade, you have a foot out the door. Like you literally are requesting to be out the door. So at the time, yes, that was true. I just think like that – that's now a couple of years in the past. And I think he's been in a much better headspace and a much better spot since then. And I don't think he's lying when he says he wants to stay in Boston. Like he rescinded the trade request. He signed an extension. I think he would absolutely sign another extension, but when and how that gets done and what it looks like is, you know, going to be fascinating because he, he is off to a slow start production wise. Um, I don't think it's going to happen for a while because if you have the Bruins right now, you look at the, you know, if you're Don Sweeney specifically, you look at the start and you say, well, why would we go up from whatever number we're starting at? And if you're DeBrusque, you're not going to sign when your value's low. Like you're going to, you're going to bet on yourself to, to do what Bridget said, like be better the next 20 games, the second half of the season, finish strong and earn yourself more money. You're not, you know, it would be kind of foolish business to sign when you have uh, whatever is at eight points in 20 games. Um, so I think it's going to take a little while to play out. And honestly, it wouldn't even surprise me if it does go to the off season. It's, you know, and, and either, either like they eventually sign him leading up to free agency or even hits free agency and sees what else is out there. Um, but yeah, as far as trading him, Unless you're getting back shore fire, you know, I'll say middle six talent because I don't I don't think DeBrusque is is a true top liner, so I'll call him a middle six winger. Um unless you're getting that back or or an upgrade, like the Bruins aren't in a position to give away any talent that can play on their top three lines on the wing. Um and last to response, so Brian, you mentioned advanced stats. I would say just to highlight why I'm not still not overly concerned about DeBras. This isn't even that advanced. So this is five on five goal differential. How many goals do the Bruins score when you're on the ice? How many does the opponent score? Guess where Jake DeBrusk ranks on the Bruins? Is he first? <laughs> he is third. Third. Uh, Hampus Lindholm and Brandon Carlo are both a plus nine. Okay, Jake so DeBrus he's first among the forwards then. Jake DeBrusque is a plus seven. Yep, first among Bruins forwards. So, and now if I go a little more advanced, expected goals percentage, he's first on the team, 56.6%. So that's showing, you know, scoring chances when he's on the yeah, ice. And I, I know his production's not there, but more- I'm hearing Brian grow in the back. <laughs> I mean, it is just like- I it is, hate- it is a, I hate is, the expected one. Expected. All right, then, then stick with stick with the real goals. 12, 12 to five when he's on the ice. They're outscoring opponents. No, that that one like, I like. That one I like. That's fine. I like that. Yeah. One. So it. My overall point here is just that more, a lot more good things than bad things are happening when he's on the ice. And yes, I want it. I would like to see him produce more. He has to produce more. But as long as that remains the case, that the Bruins are still a plus team when he's out there, like. I'm just not panicking because there's other guys right now who are minuses, especially over this most recent stretch. Hey, can I, can I turn it to Scott for a second? And there's, there's one, there's one stat that I actually am surprised people are like not putting a lot of stock in these days. And it kind of surprised me because I think it's a, I actually think it's a pretty important stat, but maybe I'm on an, on an Island here. And before I say that, just, for the kids keeping score at home. I'm don't say goals. for please don't say goals. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm for uh I'm for um you know re-signing the brusque if it's you know not an overpay as Bridget mentioned. Like I, I don't dislike the player. I, I know I may it may have sounded like the to the contrary earlier. I I hope I stated I think he's gonna break out of this and he's gonna score more. But um 
you know, when you're, when you're, when you're paid to produce and you're expected to produce, you need to produce, not expect to produce. You need to produce at a certain point. So, but real quick people, uh, plus minus is a very important, um, I put a lot of stock in plus minus, uh, with players. Um, and people don't apparently think that's a, that's a big stat. Like that's, that's straight up like the differential between the goals you're on the ice for and goals you're not on the ice for. And I think that's an important stat, but people seem to not think so. Well, so here's my pitch on, on that is I, I think it's worth looking at goal. Like I just laid out the brush goals you're on the ice for versus against where I think plus minus does a disservice is all the kind of like all the screwy stuff that gets lumped in. Like if you're on the ice for a shorthanded goal against, you get a minus. If you're on the ice for an extra attack or a goal against, you you know, like an empty netter against, you get a minus. And I just think that makes it kind of loopy. Like you mentioned earlier, you mentioned like McAvoy being a minus two. And it's like, well, at five on five, he's actually a plus two. And like, it, it, McAvoy over these last um, four five games or something is like a minus seven, but a couple of those were like empty netters against that he's out there for, and I just think that's where it gets a bit wacky, and it's why I would just let, rather stick to five on five goal differential because then you're you're taking all the screwy stuff out of it. I think it's a good indicator though, like like it generally does indicate how a season is going for someone or like how a game is gone for someone. Like you have some guys that are, especially you have like the extreme, like right now, Oh, well, remember Chara's plus minus was always through the roof. It's like, okay, well, that's a good indicator for how he's been doing because you know, he's, he's a great defender. Uh, so you can, I think there is stuff you can glean from it. It's not a perfect stat, but I, I, but, I also yeah. like Brian, do look at it and, and like kind of then you go into a deeper dive of okay what did these goals against look like what were the situations but like you can start there and then look deeper no i just like i just think i wish we could just start with five on five goal differential like i wish they just changed the stat to five on five goal differential because that's like 90 percent of what it already is and then it's that other 10 percent that just makes it screwy and in my opinion not totally useless, but much not as useful as five is just keeping it to five. Yeah. Like if you're, you're saying like in the stats sheet, like you can filter goals, assists, points, you'd rather it just say five on five goal differential instead of. No, I'd, I'd, I'd rather still call it plus minus, oh. but just change how it's defined. And because like, I, I think most people don't even realize that like all that other crap counts against it. Like, empty net goals and shorthanded goals. I actually am one of them. I, I thought, I thought a shorthanded goal was not, was omitted from your plus minus. I thought that. No, it, shorthanded. If the other team scores a shorthanded goal on your power play. Yeah. Right. You, you get a minus. Also, if you score a shorthanded yes. goal, you get a plus. No, no, hold on. So, okay. Well, that makes sense. Cause you're up a man. So you should get a dash for that. You should get two dashes for that. Um, <laughs> if you, if you're, if you're on the penalty kill and you give up a goal, that goes against you plus minus. No, no, okay, yeah, no, yeah, I didn't think so. So, so it is, it is kind of like a representation aside from extra attackers. Like McAvoy is not getting knocked on his plus minus for being on the PK. No, but even like the extra attacker stuff, like part of the reason, you know, look, all the Bruins are really good last year, but like their plus minus also got uh, ballooned a bit because they scored a bunch of empty net goals because they were always up so I don't, like i said i would just get rid of all that stuff and make it sure. just five on five and yeah. then i would think it's actually pretty valuable yeah i mean i would still argue like for the most part it's pretty accurate i mean it's it's there's only so many times where uh whatever whatever but i mean it, <laughs> well here, here's, yeah, here's, here's a tangent i wasn't expecting to. well here here's here's one case where it wasn't accurate and people tried to use it inaccurately um, that almost had a real world effect. And this was Eric Carlson's Norris campaign last year, where one of the strongest arguments against him was his plus minus. And I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but it was like, it was like legitimately insane where he, he was like a minus 15 or something. And a bunch of it was like shorthanded goals and uh, 
like empty netters or because the Sharks were trailing so much that he was out there with his own net empty. And a put, he was out there for like 10 empty net goals or something. So that like it all stacks into his plus minus. And if you looked at five on five, Eric Carlson was actually a plus. He was the only player on the San Jose Sharks who was a plus at five on five. But everyone used plus minus to argue against him. And it's like, if anything, that almost should have gone the opposite way where it's like, He's the only one making a positive differential on this awful team. Yeah. I mean, if if you're – so if there's an empty net situation, like I agree with you, that's kind of like it adds it adds fluff. But if you're on the power play and you give up a shorthanded goal, I'm not shedding any tears for that hurting your plus minus. And if you are on the shorthand and you score a power play goal, like, I mean, obviously – Kudos to that. So I mean, it really for me, it really just seems like the empty net is the biggest problem here. Yeah. Everything else is is deserved, in my opinion. If you give up a shorthanded goal, like why why should that not be a minus? Like you just give up a shorthanded goal. Like I said, dash two. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I I could settle in the middle there. Like that's fine, but yeah. Um... Well, what well, well, what what's your pro? If 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 McAvoy's on the power play and coughs up the puck and and the PK goes out and scores. Why does that bother you if that's a, a minus on him? He's got an extra player on the ice. I mean, it's just not totally even. Like, if obviously, if you're if you're a power play only player, then you you can only be in a situation to get a minus on special teams, right? Like, like David Pasternak could only ever get a minus on special teams because he's never going to be out there for a shorthanded goal four because it doesn't kill penalties. So. I just think stick keeping it to five on five. Yeah, I understand. It, yeah, is it's the only way to keep it even for for. Everyone. Yeah, no, no. I, I honestly, I actually don't disagree with that. I think it is the most accurate way. Um, but I just, I think the empty net's the biggest one. That's the biggest one for me. But that's a good point. Um, if a player is solely never play has the opportunity to, yeah, chalk it up under a conversation. Didn't expect to have today, but um, what were we even talking about before that? I don't even know. Debrusque. Oh yeah. And what stats you what stats you look into for a player? <laughs> well, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, the whole for DeBrusque in particular, it's like I can only hear somebody look. If you're telling me for three months, you know, his goals above his 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 expected goals per sixty are you know top five in a league, but he's still got four goals in December. I mean, there's an issue there. I'm sorry, I can only I can only take those stats for so long. If it's a short sample size, like a like a you know, 10 game or five, five to 10 game slump. Uh, that's one thing. But as we get into December here, it's like, okay, so you mean to tell me for half the season almost, which I'm just, we're not there yet. We're a quarter of the way through. I'm just saying like at some point, Scott, you would admit that like these advanced analytics need to come to the forefront and, and, and be tangible production. That's all I'm saying with the stats, the advanced stats. <laughs> no. Yeah. I fully acknowledge he has to score more. Like that's part of what he's relied on. Um, I just say like my panic level over DeBrusque would would go up if like we saw a stretch where he starts to be on the ice for more goals against than four and is having breakdowns defensively and you know you watch a play and you're like wow DeBrusque didn't cover his defenseman there or DeBrusque didn't get back in the back check and they gave up a goal like that is well, really like when bad I would start turnovers to that lead to goals against and right. stuff like that sure yeah. that's fair that's fair. No, 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 no arguments here. Because like, I don't think I can recall him mishandling pucks as much as some of the other guys, like Marshawn, like recently at least. Um, do you do you guys see him? Do you guys see him like doing everything it takes to win? No, besides like, and I'm not even saying it's just him because I this can be said for everybody. But like, have you noticed him being like hard, really hard, like really hard in the forecheck? doing anything it takes to like that goal he scored against Florida. Like that, that all happens because of a strong four check. Um, I'm not saying he hasn't been doing it here and there, but like if you're slumping, like, do you see him like, you know, making the extra effort to finish a check? Do you see him blocking those extra shots? If you do great, maybe I'm just watching the whole product, not just him. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's honestly, he's, he's fine. He's going to break out of it. Um, I don't really have an issue well, with the brusque. Honestly, I think he'll be fine. I'm just talking a lot here. Yeah, I think I think you you start to see it, and like not just that goal that you mentioned, which you know was was obvious, but also even like the power play goal where he's banging away in front and, and willing to stand in there, and it's like 
you would hope that would then lead to more plays, more efforts like that. And it's like it does for a couple of games, and then it starts to fade a little bit. And he's got to – like he, he does have to find like that consistent level where he's doing that every game. And you would hope that like understanding, hey, that just helped me get two goals – would kind of like lead to like, well, maybe I should keep doing it because it's going to keep helping me score. Um, again, I think like Monday's a tough game to judge because the whole team was so bad. But mm. um, yeah, I I didn't notice him like standing he, out positively. I feel like um, one of my favorite versions of him as a player in Boston was his rookie year, and like, and remember that game against. Um, that series against Toronto. I mean, games, obviously game seven was a huge uh, high point for him in his career. So it's kind of unfair to use that and be like, he should be like that all the time. But I just remember that series and the series against Tampa, like he was such a menace and just like went to the net hard. And I remember thinking to myself like, Oh, they got, they have a really good player in this kid for a long time. Like goes to the net, goes to the dirty areas, has talent, speed, uh, hands in tight, good shot. But inconsistency is just what, when I think of Jake DeBrus, the first word that comes to mind is inconsistent. Like it's the first word that comes to my mind. And when he's on his game, I think he's a really, really strong player. I think that I, I, I think that I'll just, this is my last thing I'm going to say about the DeBrus thing. Um, I think if, if inconsistent comes to mind, like as the first thing to describe Jake DeBrus, I also think misunderstood is a good word to describe Jake DeBrusque for like people's impressions were so negative and they never got back on track and like never really considered some of the reasons why he wanted the trade request or, or, you know, had struggles when he did um, during the pandemic and whatnot. I think he is probably the most misunderstood person on the team. Um, but to come full circle on the Jake DeBrusque uh, conversation back to Scott's first shift. Um, I think that the production, if if he's genuinely kept on this line for any any amount of time, like a decent amount of time, it's not just like try it one game and then go away from it. If he's on a line with Pasternak, Patra, and Nebraska, he's going to score more. Like he's going to score more. And if he's if he ends up with power play time on the first unit, which we're not sure he will or, or won't, but that he did score a goal on it he'll he's going to end up producing more um there so like full circle so maybe the line changes could also be a catalyst to some of the production we're talking about well and you know and that's if montgomery decides to do that uh and i guess we'll we'll, we'll see how they line up at wednesday's practice but it was he really only got like a couple shifts there yeah i think it was in the second Monday. period yeah. or maybe the early third period but they did they did go to that for a little bit and that that really I think gives them the best chance for pos for Patra and for DeBrusque. And like you mentioned, that first line was stagnant anyway. So put Pasternak there, see if that unlocks some of the scoring abilities of both of the other guys and even the playmaking ability of both of those other guys. Yeah, the, I think quickly we we can try to keep this a little short, but there is a obviously a big story we have to touch on and we speculated, you know, about could the Bruins maybe be connected to him? Uh, as it turns out, Patrick Kane is going to the Detroit Red Wings. Um, news of that broke Tuesday morning, uh, one year, 2.75 million. Just curious what, you know, kind of what you guys' reaction are. And, and before I get that, uh, I have to correct something I said last podcast just because I didn't hadn't fully done done my research yet. Was it but, mouses? Uh, I confirmed that that is in fact the plural of mouse. <laughs> they, they, I called called my friends at Marion website. They actually just changed it yesterday. Oh wow! Pretty crazy. Yep. So I'm, I'm right. <laughs> um, no, but uh, I had mentioned that I thought Kane was eligible for like the over thirty five bonuses he was not because he you had to have turned 35 before june 30th and he was still 34 so that that really would have made it extra difficult for the bruins um because they couldn't kane wasn't eligible to sign like a one million dollar deal with 
three million in bonuses. It his whole salary had to be like an actual cap hit. Well, I mean, obviously, I hope the listeners forgive you, Scott, for that misleading them like that. But um, it's <laughs> I think it's it's inexcusable. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously my initial reactions are, I think it's a interesting fit when I heard that he wanted to go to a contender, Detroit wasn't on top of my mind. Cause I think they're clearly a team that has playoff hopes, but wouldn't classify him as a contender just yet. Um, but obviously reunites with, with to Um, I think Detroit's got a really good combination of, uh, youth and veterans over there and they're playing really well. So pertains to the Bruins. It's a, it's a, a divisional rival, a divisional opponent that got stronger. Um, I don't think that Patrick Kane's going to hurt the Red Wings at all. I think he's going to help them offensively. And, um, you know, he's gone to three teams down his career, all original six. So that's pretty cool for him. But, um, yeah, I mean, Detroit gets a little bit stronger up front. Yeah, and I think if if you're talking about contenders that had – a way to add him like obviously the Rangers had already moved on from him the Bruins we mentioned probably didn't have the cap space or or weren't willing to send someone else in send someone else out to get him in it did kind of leave just a few teams and Detroit has been a team that has had the Bruins number this season which could make them exactly the kind of contender you're thinking about because a, a team that can that has the ability to beat some of the best goaltending in defense in the country with the Bruins is a team that has a chance to make it to the Stanley cup. They have a chance to get past a team like the Rangers or the Bruins. So I think they are a legitimate contender. And I think that's not a bad choice for him to go somewhere. It could be a great fit for him there. Um, it does make the, the conference, the division more difficult. Um, you probably were hoping he ended up somewhere outside, but most of the rumors did have to do with, Eastern Conference teams like we'd heard Toronto, we'd we'd heard, um, you know, you, I think you mentioned Dallas, maybe Brian, like that would have been an outside team he could have gone to, but he ends up in the Eastern Conference, and it we'll see. I'm still a little bit skeptical. Obviously, in his prime, Patrick Kane was incredible, one of the best players. Um, just not really sure how. He's going to hold up health wise. So that's what makes me think like, okay, yeah, that's, that's definitely kind of like a, a secret weapon that you might get on the plus side, but he could, you know, he could not pan out at all, but it's not a huge risk for them because, you know, the contract isn't huge and they, you know, maybe, maybe it does give them that extra piece to push them over the top. Yeah. I, I, so I said on the last pod, but, I do think there's risk in, in signing Patrick Kane and committing 2.75 million. Um, the Red Wings can absorb that risk better than most because they had, they had over $5 million in cap space. So even with this signing, like they still have enough cap space to potentially add someone else if they decide to go for it at the trade deadline. Whereas other, you know, like just using the Bruins as, as an example, one, they would have to trade someone away now. And two, then they really probably wouldn't be able to add anyone else at the deadline. So it's like Patrick Kane would be the one addition and you you would have to hope that it, it works out. And there's legitimate questions there. He's He does not play defense at all. And there's advanced metrics that suggest, especially last year, that his negative impact defensively outweighed his offensive impact. Um and the other thing is he had that hip resurfacing surgery that he had, like that is the real deal. Like that is a tough surgery. And if you look at the track record of athletes that have had it, like it's not pretty. Ryan Kessler never played another NHL game after it and was planning to. Nicholas Backstrom returned from it last year, struggled, had one point in eight games this season, and then took a leave of absence because it was bothering him. Like uh, outside of hockey, Isaiah Thomas, former Celtics guard, had it, was never the same. Uh, Andy Murray and tennis had it and took like years to get back to anything close to a high level. So there's just no guarantees. Like Patrick, if Patrick Kane comes back and looks like vintage Kane or, or something close to it, he would be the exception to the rule when it comes to that surgery. 
And you did a real deep dive in, into that with your Andy Murray, your Andy Murray stuff. I love tennis, so I like I like the poll for Andy. Well, <laughs> Andy actually, actually, I found that because when I was reading about Backstrom, uh, Backstrom reached out to Andy Murray like while he was going through it. So that's that's how I found that out. Well, the good news the good news for the Red Wings is that before they even get Patrick Kane, they're tenth in the standings league wide, and. You know, if they do get that version of Patrick Kane, Scott, um, that's kind of the anomaly, the exception to the rule. I mean, the the best uh, the best division in the league just got that much tougher because uh, the top four teams in the Atlantic um, are well, the top three teams in the Atlantic are in the top ten in the standings league wide, and if you extend it to the fourth team being Tampa Bay, I believe um, they uh, the top four teams in the Atlantic are within the top thirteen seeds league wide. So it's just you know it's it's a competitive division, no doubt about that. We knew that going in, and we knew that in addition to Bergeron and Krejci moving on, that would be why it'd be tough for Boston to to compete. But so far, they have a little slide as of late. But um, that's why you play eighty two. So they get back at it again against the Sharks and Bridge and Scott. If you have nothing else, um, we will talk to you after that game. So thank you all for listening, and we'll talk to you very soon. Hey guys, thanks for watching the Skate Podcast. If you want to see more of our videos, visit our playlist. Not in front of a screen. You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow us on social media. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment.